This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So let me give you a little bit of background here. I was on Twitter yesterday, which we all know is, is not always a good idea for me, but I was. I was on Twitter and I was doing my normal Twitter thing and I came across somebody who just had a, just, just kind of like had a complaint like just as just an off the cuff complaint, not like someone had posted a huge Twitter rant and then tagged Leonard French. No, this person had just been like, geez, Thingiverse, I really wish you'd put my thing back up. And then somebody else came along and tagged me. And then that's how I saw it. And I was like, what? What's this about? And so a couple it took a couple hours for it to finally get my attention. And I was like, what's going on here? And I, I actually reached out to the person and got permission to talk about this in detail. The gentleman is Chris Taylor Jr. He is the guy, you might know about this, he's the guy who moved from Pennsylvania to, I think, New Mexico or something like that by, after he bought a school bus. This was guy was on Reddit a little while ago, I think, because of this. So he has a GoFundMe where he explains about how, uh, I believe it was his father had passed away and had left him... <clears throat> yeah, like he, norm, Normally, you're... you're, you're, you're relatives can't necessarily pass away and leave you in debt but they could be in so much debt that by the time you clean it all up like some of it's passed on to you too i'd have to get the exact details but here he ended up in a lot of debt to try to get his family out of uh the situation left by uh his by you know by the unfortunate passing of his father i think it was his father and so he apparently did somehow get through all of that, but needed to move or something. And there's more details in this GoFundMe. Uh, maybe we can go over if we need to, because this story is not about his one-way shot on a school bus. So he has received some kind of takedown notice. I think he's received more than one on his Thingiverse page. So yeah, here's, you can download all, all files, you can tip the designer. Chris Taylor Jr. has received some kind of takedown notice on one of his models, which I will bring up. It is nearly identical, in my opinion, I'm not speaking for Chris, that it is nearly identical to something called a hex chest dice box sold by Elderwood Games at elderwoodacademy.com. Now, if we look at this image, that's 3D printed. I only, I only do see the inside of the box. I don't think we're actually talking about this, the decorated top part of the box. That's the part that I would expect there to be a trademark dispute over. But no, the trademark dispute is over the inside design of the box. So Chris Taylor's box and, and his dispute is over the inside of the box that he is 3D printing or has available on Thingiverse. And this got my attention because that doesn't, that doesn't sound entirely trademarkable to me. No, it doesn't. That you would be able to simply trademark a hexagon box with hexagon holes in it. Sure, they could trademark and probably, and, and I mean, they could hold a copyright on the design and they could also hold a trademark on the, the decorative portion of the box, but just a plain hexagon box with a beehive interior? I don't, I don't know that they can trademark that. Well, we wouldn't be here if they hadn't already done so. As a trademark, because I know that there's patent or design patents where you can um, claim a very, very limited patent on the look of something. And that can be, especially like for things that are not quite copyrightable, uh, you can still get some protection if it's, if it's for your item and the way that your item looks so people can't copy the exact same design. But uh, trademark, interesting. Yes, so if you look at the screen, um, they have, this is the TSDR, the Trademark Status Database. Uh, I forget if that's actually what it stands for. Um, but this is where you'll find current status and is the live trademark application. 
this trademark has been granted, has been published for opposition, and is now in its, I believe, six-month opposition period as of December 10th. But it didn't get there very easily. It was applied for in September of 2018 and was initially rejected, I think, twice. And then an attorney got involved, and all of a sudden, the trademark is granted. Let's see a little bit what this mark is about. I'm going to go to the Goods and Services tab here, where it says that the Goods and Services listing is for dice boxes, namely boxes specifically adapted for storing dice, wooden boxes specifically adapted for storing board game components or dice, board game tabletop accessories. It's in these following class uh, 28 and a few others. And its basis is 1A, which means actual use in commerce. And they say that the first use in commerce was October 2nd, 2014. The attorney is none other than Stephen MacArthur, who is a gamer who has, I, I did, I met him at PAX Unplugged. And he is a great guy. I have no problem with him. I do think that this is not a proper trademark, at least not until I learn more about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm half inclined to offer to help oppose this, either myself or through trademark litigators that I know and have used before. So new application, September 24th, 2018, and an, an office action, December 4th, 2018, a year ago, and then some correspondence and then a final refusal. And then some more correspondence, and then that was October 28th, 2019, it seemed, that uh, Stephen MacArthur wrote to the trademark examiner, and then October 30th, 2019, it suddenly approved. So I'm not sure what they talked about. I'm not saying there's anything untoward going on. In fact, the opposite. They probably filed something that finally satisfied the trademark examiner. But first, before we get there, I thought we would look at the initial refusal and go over it. Because as much as I am familiar with copyright and its progeny, I am not familiar with trademark so much. I do believe that I could represent in a simple trademark action. This is somewhere on the edge of simple to complex. If a simple phone call to opposing counsel would clear everything up and get Chris Taylor's thingiverse thing back up, great. But if they're trying to trademark a basic hexagon box, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. So this is their initial specimen. This was a picture, oh, exactly the same website that I just showed you. That's actually the specimen that they're using. That's the initial specimen. And then they have a drawing, and this is the drawing that they're saying is so distinctive that it warrants trademark protection. I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, if I saw that, am I going to associate that with a particular source? So only one company can make a box that looks, that's whose interior looks like this. Now, isn't the interior of a box functional? Isn't all the separated walls and everything like that functional? I think so, because they even say for the purpose of storing dice. Yeah, so that's where I'm getting thrown here. Their their, their description even sounds more patenty. So Doesn't then it? they get an office action. The first one, December fourth, twenty eighteen. Oh, wait, they were. They had Stephen MacArthur as their attorney the whole time. Okay, because um, that's uh, that's this is, this is the the initial office action back in in twenty eighteen. And this one says things about non distinctive product design, which is what we literally just said. Um, and then various other requirements that were not met or need to be met. And they say, registration is refused because the applied for mark consists of a non-distinct product design or non-distinct feature of product design that is not registrable on the principal register without proof of acquired distinctiveness. Okay. Contrary to applicants' claim of inherent distinctiveness, a product design can never be inherently distinctive as a matter of law. So inherent distinctiveness would be like Apple computer or Xerox copiers. Apple doesn't mean anything in relationship to computers. It is arbitrary. 
Xerox doesn't mean anything at all. It's a made up word. It's fanciful. These are the strongest levels of trademark protection. And so those trademarks have inherent distinctiveness. Uh, the, the, opposite, the example of a non-distinctive, non-design trademark would be like Joe's Battery and Tire, which is a legitimate business in my area in Allentown, Pennsylvania. But you, you can, I guarantee you that you cannot just apply for a trademark on Joe's Battery and Tire. You need to show some kind of secondary, uh, uh, secondary distinctiveness, or what they're calling here, acquired distinctiveness. And I just realized I forgot my hat, so here's my hat. I'm even wearing the right headphones for the hat. I just forgot to put the hat on. Contrary to applicants' claim of inherent distinctiveness, a product design itself, a product design, can never be inherently distinctive. Why? Because product design is for patents because that kind of protection is for patents. Trademark only protects a product design that can show, uh, among other things, acquired distinctiveness. The trademark examiner continues, consumers are aware that product designs are intended to render the goods more useful or appealing rather than be an identifier of the source of the goods, in other words, a brand. Thus, consumer predisposition to equate a product design with its source does not exist. Hence, when I look at that box, I have no inclination to be associating a honeycomb box with Elderwood Games. Anybody could make a, a honeycomb box. I, I, maybe I want a different designer to make a honeycomb box out of a different material. Or maybe I want something higher quality. Or maybe I want something lower quality than what Elderwood Games is making. I don't see how that can be a trademarkable thing. It's what they have to show acquired distinctiveness. So in a moment, we'll see what they came up with as their response or proof of acquired distinctiveness. The trademark examiner continues. To support this claim of acquired distinctiveness, applicant may submit evidence. This evidence may be advertising expenditures, sales success, length and exclusivity of use, unsolicited media coverage, in other words, not where they went and wrote their own media coverage and then paid somebody like web PR or PR web or whatever to publish it for them and, and get it out there. That's a thing that happens, by the way. You can pay three or four hundred dollars to have your news article published. A showing of acquired distinctiveness need not consider all of these types of evidence. No single factor is determinative. However, the evidence must relate to the promotion and recognition of the specific configuration embodied in the applied for mark and not to the goods in general. To establish acquired distinctiveness, an applicant may rely only on use in commerce that is regulated by the U.S. Congress. Use in a foreign country is not evidence. So I'm going to stop there with this trademark office action. Thoughts so far? I think the only world where I could see this being a trademark would be if somehow the that, that box is so, so fundamental and so familiar to the brand somehow that simply, you know, it'd be like making a 3D printed version of a logo. Yeah. I'm not even sure that this could survive being a logo. Like there would have to be more. Like if it said Elderwood Games as part of it, that would be much easier for me. And then the Thingiverse model could just not say Elderwood Games. I feel like they're trying right. to get a monopoly on a functional item through a trademark, which is what patent is for. That's what's so confusing about this. When I saw this last night when you posted it, I was like, that's not a trademark. Yeah, huh? <laughs> like, wait a second. Yeah, yeah. That's when I go to the store and think of buying something that's that that is come comes from a brand. Like it has something that's distinctive. It has something that that sets it apart. A Swiss Army knife is very functional, but still looks like a Swiss Army knife. It's got that distinctive red color, it's got the Victorinox logo. And it's got the design of, of the functions of the, the folding, you know, tools and implements and all that. If it was just a folding knife with a bunch of different tools in it, even if they look like a Victorinox folding tool knife, but it doesn't have protected red color and, and, and a, a distinctive logo, 
I, I, doesn't, I, don't, I don't think of it as, oh, that's a Victorinox Swiss Army knife. I just go, oh, that's a copy of a Victorinox Swiss Army knife. You know? Yeah, for me, this reminds me of like walking down the cereal aisle and you'll have, you know how you'll have the brand honeycombs and then next to it, you'll have the store brand. It yeah. will be like bee combs made with honey. Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> it's like 50 cents cheaper. Yeah, um, exactly. And so the the cereal looks very very similar they can even sort of have a honeycomb type shape to it or a hexagon shape to it but the the branding in terms of the outside of the box it's it's very different so obviously it's comparable to the brand honeycombs but it yeah. you can tell that it's not the same source and so this being the inside of a box makes me um question yeah, a bit about the trademarkiness because if I'm walking down the aisle and I'm shopping, can I see the inside of the box before I buy it? Oh, that's a, that's, that's a good, good question point. as well. Here then is their second specimen. Now the other thing is that a honeycomb is a naturally occurring shape. This is a not only a hexagon, and I can't imagine that hexagons are are patentable or trademarkable, but this is just a hexagonal arrangement of hexagons in a honeycomb pattern, which is exactly what bees make. So how can you trademark a honeycomb pattern that occurs in nature? That's my second question. These, these are questions that I will ask our trademark litigator if we move forward with representing Chris Taylor. And the whole like six-sided and, you know, normal dice are six-sided. So even the cho choice of a hexagon versus, you know, like a pentagon or an octagon or something, like there's a little bit of a reason for that. You can kind of see the connection. Yeah. I mean, maybe the screws, if you go back to the image, maybe the screws in there are what make it so distinctive. I mean, I'm stretching If the screws here, have I, I, no functionality, but it looks to me, it looks to me like the screws are actually where they put the Squares. honeycomb pattern in or something maybe yeah. no okay maybe not looking at the open interior box still has the screws okay so i don't know what the screws are for maybe the screws are are, are holding a magnet or something and it's a, i'm assuming it's a magnetic box uh, that would also be functional if the screws were not functional then yes maybe the screws are part of it reminder the screws are not in this yeah offending image and then here's their drawing. There's a bigger version of their drawing. This is what they are saying is going to be owned by Elderwood Games. I've got to move myself again. If Elderwood Games gets this trademark, and they already have, so that means it's published for opposition, means now is the time to oppose it, then this is what they'll be able to make. And no one else will be able to make this shape in dice boxes. I mean, somebody could make the shape for car tires or something, I don't know, but they wouldn't be able to make it for dice boxes. You could have a new Coca-Cola can with this pattern on it or made out of this pattern, but you could not have a dice box made like this. That seems a bit much, if, if you ask me. Anyone else concerned with this image? If you look at the design on the right-hand side there, that sort of looks more to the shape of a logo. I still just can't get past the fact that this is a, this is a functional thing. I just can't get over that. Yeah, right? It's meant, the, the the one on the right is meant to fit into the one on the left. Like, that's also right. a function It's exactly it. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, then I'm, let's, having, I'm trying to make the case. I just can't. <laughs> I, can't I can't defend this. Uh, then let's talk about the next office action, which occurred then on June 18th, about three weeks after they filed all that stuff. Oh, what trade dresses? Because I want to ask you a question about the difference between a design pattern and trade dress. So like, so trade dresses is, is imagine if you have uh, a restaurant, um, maybe let, let's 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 back off of goats on the roof. And maybe we just think about how the restaurant will have a red stripe, a yellow stripe, a red stripe, its logo, it'll be made of, uh, you know, an old Alamo style uh, building, and the interior will be covered in cheap things, antiques that people have found around the world, uh, around the country or area or something like that. Um, well, maybe you can't get a trademark on red, yellow, red, but you could get a trademark on the overall concept and feel or trade dress. 
the characteristics of the visual appearance of a product that signify its source. Trade dressing in this example with the Coke bottle is the distinctive shape of the Coke bottle. I was just thinking about this uh, yesterday um, when I was in a big grocery store here called Alchen, um, or however you pronounce it, I'm still learning, Oshan, excuse me, as in like ocean? Very close. Very close. Okay, Oshan. Uh, so we were in Oshan, a very large grocery store here in, in southern Luxembourg. And I, well, it's in Luxembourg in general, right? And uh, I'm looking up and down the aisle to try and see my product. Like, I think I was looking for Nutella Be Readies. And I was, I, I literally was like standing at the edge of a massive aisle. And I was just like scanning it with my eyes, looking for that distinctive brown, white, brown color with a, with the logo and like the picture of the product on it. And I did from across, from like 75 feet away, I was able to see this distinctive box and walk straight to it and go, and even though it was a box of quantity 15 and I was used to a box of quantity four or whatever, like the pattern, the trade dress was the same and I could immediately pick out the product that I wanted. That's exactly what they want. Nutella wants you to be able to look down the aisle and oh yeah, there's the bottles of Nutella. Are they real Nutella or is it generic Nutella? Well, does it look like the real thing or does it look like a fake thing? And you can tell when trademarks are enforced, you can tell the difference as a consumer nearly instantaneously. If you're confused about it, that's actual trademark confusion. And that's not supposed to happen. Well, here's where I think that, I think uh, if you're going to argue trade dress on this, which I think might be what they're going to do, I think the, the counter to that is you look at um, wine bottles, which uh, serve the, yeah. they're exempt here because they serve the purpose of identifying something more functional. And so Dice Box certainly seems more like a wine bottle than it does yeah. like a brand of Coke. Now, you know? wasn't there a trademark dispute with Dan Aykroyd's skull head whiskey or gin or something? Vodka. Or vodka? vodka. And that, Don't judge me for knowing the answer to that. And that was fine because it was a very distinctive bottle. It wasn't just a bottle. It was a bottle with an artistic design on it and that a skull head. And it was a very specific skull head. And it, it, it was enough, I believe it was enough to warrant trademark protection. I believe I remember Dan Aykroyd celebrating uh, and, and not, not uh, the opposite. But uh, somebody correct me on that one. Refresh my memory. Here is the June 18th, 2019 office action. This is the most recent office action in the Elderwood Games application. They still have been refused for non-distinctive final product design. And this is the final refusal. So this is the last chance. So this is an actual attorney who represents the trademark office and examines the trademarks and refuses based on certain reasons. And they say, applicants' arguments have been considered and found unpersuasive for the reasons set forth below. This final office action issues for failure to function as a trademark. The applied for mark consists of a non-distinctive product design or non-distinctive features of a product design that is not registrable on the principal register without sufficient proof of acquired distinctiveness. Applicant appears to argue that its mark is both inherently distinctive and has acquired distinctiveness, which are inconsistent and unclear. First, to the extent applicant is claiming that the mark has acquired distinctiveness, applicant has not properly submitted its claim under Section 2F, the Acquired Distinctiveness section of the Trademark Act. Additionally, contrary to the applicant's claim of inherent distinctiveness, a product design can never be inherently distinctive as a matter of law. Consumers are aware of such, we said that before, see Walmart Stores Inc. v. Samara Brothers, S-A-M-A-R-A, -A -A, and Inri Slokovage, S-L-O-K-E-V-A-G-E, -E. we can search for those cases then. Consumer predisposition to equate a product design with its source does not exist. So again, the trademark examiner is saying, no, you can't use trademark to protect this product design. That's patent. Again, in response to this refusal, applicant may assert a claim for acquired distinctiveness and to establish that they have to show various evidence that we went over a little bit ago. And then here's what they claim to have submitted before that was refused. Applicant bears the burden of proving that a mark has acquired distinctiveness under trademark section 2F, 
To show that a mark has acquired distinctiveness, an applicant must demonstrate that the relevant public understands the primary significance of the mark as identifying the source of a product or service rather than the product or service itself. Allegations of sales and advertising expenditures do not automatically or per se establish that a mark has acquired significance as a mark. An applicant must also provide the actual advertising material so that the examining attorney may determine how that mark is used, the commercial impression created by such use, and the significance the mark would have to prospective purchasers. The ultimate test in determining acquisition of distinctiveness is not applicants' efforts, but applicants' success in educating the public to associate the claimed mark with a single source. So they have to show evidence that the actual dice box buying public knows exactly who makes this honeycomb shaped box. Not that they're trying to get them, but that they already know who is the only company that makes a honeycomb shaped dice box. Furthermore, applicant provided evidence of modest advertising expenditures to support the claim that the applied for mark acquired distinctiveness. However, this evidence is not dispositive. Applicants' advertising expenditures are merely indicative of its efforts to develop distinctiveness, not evidence that it already has acquired distinctiveness. Furthermore, applicant has not provided any evidence that its advertising contains any look-for language that touts its design as a mark for applicants' goods. So there's a helpful hint for you. If you're trying to acquire distinctiveness, put some thing, put some thing in your branding that says, look for our honeycomb shape. Only our box has this honeycomb shape, would be what they would want to say. Additionally, two of the four affidavits and declarations applicant provided are from employees and officers in support of applicant's claim. Although consumer affidavits and declarations to assert recognition of a mark as an indicator of a source are relevant, affidavits and declarations of an applicant's employees, officers, and attorneys are self-serving and entitled to little weight. Finally, applicant's list of links showing purported unsolicited media coverage something because such a list does not make the materials properly of record. So it's a it, it's an unfortunate typo that we don't we can't really garn the exact meaning of the sentence, but I think it means it fails. The the list of links is insufficient. Specifically, applicants' internet materials have not been properly made of record, so they didn't submit those properly. They explain how to submit those properly. They have six months. That was six months ago, and so they did something that caused this to be reconsidered. And what we have here then is said reconsideration. So this is a request for reconsideration, and let's see what it says. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. I'm not sure how we're going to get through all of this. Look at all this. They submitted a lot of stuff. So bear with me while we just sort of comb through this. Here's a declaration of Mike Cameron, who is the co-founder of Dogmite. Elderwood Academy is one of our competitors. I deal with much the same clientele, and I recognize the hex chest design in the attached images as originating with Elderwood Academy. Some of the features that help us recognize their design is the hexagonal shape with six diamond shapes and six matching diamond shapes around the edge, the beehive arrangement, a blunted six point design. Okay, so hang on a sec. Let's take a few of those. The hexagonal shape of the box. Okay, yeah, hexagonal shape of the box. The six diamond shaped corners around the inside lid. Okay, those are naturally occurring diamond shaped corners because you can't have a complete hexagon. Okay, the six matching diamond shapes with pointed edges on the base of the box. Okay, I don't see that on this one. The beehive arrangement of hexagonal cutouts. Okay, I, I mean, that's, that's the, the holes for the box. The blunted six-point star design on the inside top of the box, and I don't have an inside top of the box here to, to compare it to. For me, these features of Elderwood's distinctive hex chest design distinguish Elderwood's hex chest from other dice boxes, including ours. I'm not aware of any other product which uses the same design elements or are similar in style to Elderwood's hex chest. Okay, let's continue. So here's another one. Declaration of Nicholas Dyke. Nicholas Dyke is Trinity Group International. He recognizes the hex chest design. 
huh, look, his, his uh, declaration looks almost identical. It's almost like the attorney prepared this and just sent it to them to sign. Not that that's illegal, just you should know. Here is Drew Folk from Norse Foundry. He says, Elderwood's hex chests are distinctive using the exact same language. I, I, I'm, I haven't counted and compared the individual characters, but they look like it's the exact same thing. So keep going. Here's declaration of somebody where they forgot to Im input the name up here. So obviously this is some kind of mail merge or find and replace or something, right? Again, not that that's illegal, not that attorneys, including myself, don't do that all the time. Just let's make sure you see it. Declaration, they forgot to replace the, the brackets here. And those, this is a declaration of Quentin Weir, who says that he is Elderwood Academy's co-founder. So he's obviously been, he's obviously got a, a major interest in this. So we're going to disregard Quentin Weir, not as a person, just as a, uh, just as evidence of acquired distinctiveness. Quentin Weir is a valid person. Uh, let's see. So here's a Penny Arcade post from Tycho. I don't really know what that has to do with acquired distinctiveness. Let's see. Are these the websites that he forgot to? They didn't yeah, this might be the websites that time. he forgot. So we only have a couple declarations then. We literally only have, what, three? Uh, Mike Cameron, uh, Nicholas Dyke, and Drew Falk. Okay, that makes this even weaker, in my opinion. Exhibit 8 is about how they've turned dice boxes into towers and works of art. That's great. I'm 100% behind all of that. That's really cool. I like, that's a really cool looking dice box. Exhibit 9 is how they made hex chests, okay? That's, that's self-serving, so we're going to disregard that, remember? Again, we're disregarding it for as evidence of acquired distinctiveness. That's all. Uh, let's see. Here's Numrush. I'm not even sure what this is about. Oh, because there's Wallet Kickers of the Week. Get your hex dice boxes. Now, here's the thing. This has a beautiful design on the outside, and it has little designs on the diamond shapes on the inside. That's the stuff that's trademarkable. That is something that you can't put on Thingiverse and say, yet we can make their design on Thingiverse. No, but you could make the box without this additional artwork on Thingiverse, in my opinion. And maybe we can, maybe we can make this happen. Also, yeah. in all the marketing here, they're always showing it with, uh, with the dice in there, also with the cover showing. Yeah. So, I mean, their actual marketing usage of this is the entire thing, not just the inside of it. Yeah, it's not, it's not just the the hexagonal design. Here's more gifts. So, so this is media coverage. But again, here's the design with a trademarkable design on the outside. And I, I'm arguing a non-trademarkable product design on the inside. Now, so does the medium of the box make a difference? So a lot of these images that I'm seeing look wooden, but the, um, the design from Thingiverse would not be wood. So does that make a, a difference? Does that factor into the equation at all? Um, I would certainly point it out if I was representing, but I don't know that that actually makes too terribly much of a difference. Also, as a carpenter myself, or rather woodworker, you know, amateur woodworker, um, I've made things like here is Kaylee's ring box, for example. This is the box. I made this. It's not perfect, but this is a, uh, a heartwood box or a red heart box that I made for Kaylee. Um, like, how could you trademark the shape of a box? Like, I, I don't see how there could be a shape that I would not be allowed to make and sell as a as a craftsman. That doesn't seem that doesn't seem right at all. But uh, that's you know doesn't seem right isn't exactly a great legal standard. So we're not going to go with that. I'm just I'm just pointing out it feels wrong too. A Celtic knot is not trademarkable. Uh, a basic flourish is not trademarkable. It's the trade dress is what I'm saying might be trademarkable. The overall use of those things on Elderwood Academy hex chest boxes, that may be trademarkable. I would be fighting this or wanting to fight this a lot less if that's what they were trademarking. What I think they're trademarking, I'm pretty sure they're trademarking, is simply the hexagonal design of the box. The hexagonal design with the seven hexagonals cutouts and the six diamond-shaped uh, you know, non-cutouts around the edges. That's what they're trying to trademark. Exhibit 15 is 
a review of the Elderwood Academy dice box. Again, this one is a really cool dragon design that has been laser carved, it looks like, some kind of carved, out. maybe it's CNC milled uh, out of the thing, because laser would might, might have some burn marks, I don't know. Um, so it's been some kind of carved out of the thing. Here's one that says Elderwood Academy on it. Again, if that was the trademark, no, no one is going to Thingiverse and making things that say Elderwood Academy on them. What they want to make is this, a simple wooden box with seven hexagonal cutouts. This one doesn't even have uh, separated designs on the, on the diamonds. The diamonds just naturally occur as the cuts, you know, cause the, the relief of the cuts causes the diamond to stay solid over here. Um, and then they have magnets and a little a little keychain holder thing. Not something to me that screams trademarkable. And then here's a gen fairly generic uh, top, which would just have a cutout so that the negative of the bottom could fit into the positive of the top or, or, or vice versa. So here we go. Declaration of Courtney Craft. I'm a hobby industry journalist and uh, she recognizes the exact same language. So I'm, I'm inclined, if I was to be the attorney representing here, I'm inclined to point out that all these declarations use the exact same language with the same characters in the same places as if it was a find-replace kind of thing sent by the attorney and not the original words of the declarants. Even though I'm not saying the declarants didn't declare it and didn't agree with the wording, just saying they didn't put it in their own words. Maybe the maybe the trademark is so strong that every, everyone is driven to come to the exact same conclusion with these same characters in the same format. I mean, yeah. it could just be that compelling. Doug Johnson is Dungeon and Dragons dealer and uses the exact same language. Ted Sikora does not say he's not an officer. I don't know what that means. Says he's a board games journalist and uses the exact same language language. And then here is the response. Okay, applicant three frogs submits the following response. Applicant respectfully disagrees. The evidence consists of numerous examples of unsolicited media coverage, sales success, and declarations from journalists, journalists, players, literally six of them, five or six of them. And they say that they have acquired distinctiveness from one, two, three, four, five, six people. I don't know, that's not a lot of people, but sure, that could be and that could be what got it over the threshold for the trademark examiner. And so then they show the unsolicited coverage that we just saw. However, I didn't read any of those articles to mean that they recognize the specific hex design so much as hey, these are really nice boxes. If you wanted to buy something really nice to keep your dice in, here's a really nice box. They talk about their Kickstarter. Again, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with a Kickstarter. There's nothing wrong with making hex chess boxes. Just you shouldn't be able to stop me, or in this case, Chris Taylor Jr. from making hex chest boxes or offering hex chest boxes for, for sale or download on Thingiverse. Hex chest, hex chest boxes that don't have the Elderwood Academy or Elderwood Games logo on them and aren't using any of their artwork. It is down to 30 days. We only have 30 days to oppose. And the date to oppose is 30 days from December 10th. So that would be January 9th or we, I would even say January 8th to make sure. So then, yeah, we, we only have until January 8th to file an opposition uh, on behalf of Chris Taylor if he wants us to. Now, I've spoken to Chris Taylor, and he has given me permission to talk about the issue, but I have not asked him for permission to talk about his decisions. And I'm pro I don't represent him yet, but I'm close enough to offering to that I'm not comfortable with revealing any confidential information. So I'll phrase it this way. If it turns out that Chris, because Chris Taylor would have standing, right? that Chris Taylor wants to oppose this. And if it turns out that money is an issue, because remember, this is this, this is a Chris Taylor who was forced to move across the country and chose to move across the country in a school bus, which is a really cool story and all that. And we're going to cover that at some point, maybe even talk to him about it. We'll probably ask him for an interview if he'll, if he wants to do something like that. And um, if he cannot afford to Pro to prosecute this opposition or office action or yeah opposition to prosecute an opposition to this trademark 
himself by hiring a trademark attorney at whatever the normal prices for those things are, usually a couple thousand bucks. The opposition itself is about $400 if I have uh, my information correctly, then we're going to need to help him out with that. Now, I'm not necessarily in a position to do it all by myself without help, and, and I mean both financial help and lawyer help, but I also have access to some wonderful attorneys, some great trademark attorneys. I know two attorneys specifically that I would go straight to, Marina Lewis and Catherine Kent from Lewis and Kent. Great law firm name, by the way. Like Lewis and Kent makes me think of Lewis and Clark. So um, Lewis and Kent, great trademark attorneys. Uh, and I would highly recommend that we hire them to prosecute this as an opposition by January 8th. If Chris Taylor wants to go forward with that, and if he needs help with the money, how do we feel about starting a GoFundMe and helping him out with some kind of legal defense fund? It seems like the kind of thing that we would want to stand up for the little guy um, who who is just making a generic box and is yeah. getting a trademark takedown notice on Thingiverse for his 3D printed box that just happens to be a honeycomb design, uh, but but otherwise doesn't seem to infringe on the the art, or should I say that what I believe is the non-functional part of the box, the the you know the outside, the things like that. Uh, I, I don't believe that you could make a hexagonal box with seven hexagonal cutouts in the middle without also having six diamond-shaped non-cutouts around the edges because that's just how hexagons work. Like, that's just the shape of things, Ed Sheeran. So far in my conversation with Chris Taylor, it, it, what I, and because I, I haven't actually seen the takedown, let's be fair here, I haven't seen the takedown, maybe there's more to it, I haven't seen the top of Chris Taylor's box, Maybe the top of it says Elderwood Academy Dice Box. I right. doubt. I doubt it. And if it did, I, I would say just just do that. Just take take that off. Like just don't have that on there. I doubt that. I doubt that's what got it this far. Because we did see the trademark isn't for the Elderwood Academy name or Elderwood Games or the Dragon 3D printed or 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 CNC milled top of the box. The trademark was for the hexagonal shape of the cutouts that make the box a box. And I don't think that's trademarkable. Let us know what you think in the comments and we'll reach out to Chris Taylor, see if he would like to talk to us in an interview situation on here on the stream, on, on, online. I'm qualified to represent before the USPTO, but I would much rather have someone like Marina Lewis or Catherine Kent, or actually Marina Lewis or Catherine Kent, to represent him. And if we can afford to hire the right attorney, then this will get handled properly. There's a third possibility, which is we might just talk to Stephen MacArthur and say, hey, what's up? But I, I, don't, I don't know that he's going to withdraw the application because we contacted him. I, I believe we might actually need to prepare for opposition. But uh, and maybe maybe there is a slight possibility, there is a non-zero chance that everyone in the gaming industry, the the uh, the the un, you know packs unplugged, the off the offline gaming industry, the board gaming industry, the physical game, what are we calling this? Um, that these that this that the people who play games and carry dice boxes and things that they know exactly who makes the hexagonal dice box, and it's the strongest acquired distinctiveness we've never heard of. I, I admit that I do not carry a dice box. I never bought a dice box, and I haven't touched my dice since I played Battletech back in 1996. By the way, love MechWarrior 5. Can't wait till they work out some of the bugs, but that that's what I've been looking for. Oh, well, that feels great. I love that game. Anyone who wants to play, let me know. You know, I have like two or 300 dice lying around here, and uh, Chris does too, and I have never seen this box. Okay, so it's so we got so they got six people in the industry to say they recognize the trade dress of that box, but we're not entirely sure whether that's just the only six people or whether it's one of uh, you know a million people who know exactly who Elderwood Games is and about this box. So let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, tell us whether you would want to contribute to a GoFundMe to raise money for this kind of opposition we would the plan would be again this is just an offer this is no one has confirmed this yet this is just an offer that we would hire the right attorneys 
to file an opposition to this trademark by January 8th and let the chip, let the, let the dice fall where they may. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't, no, there's no promise. There's no guarantee that we would automatically win. Uh, it's not even ethical for an attorney to guarantee or promise anything, but a... Uh, a proper way to say it would be we 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 have every reason to believe that this is not a strong mark and that we believe we would succeed in an opposition action but there's no no guarantee maybe i mean think of it this way elderwood and th is it three frog are not paying their attorney extra money to file more than they need they are paying them to file what they need and maybe you know enough to clear it but not they're not going to go and, and, and present everything under the sun if all they need is to present this. This is what they needed. It was enough. They stopped there. So it's entirely possible that there's another million people out there who are ready to say that this box has always been and will always be made only by Elderwood Academy. I doubt it, but it is worth considering having an open mind and, and, uh, and planning for that contingency. Let us know what you think.